Welcome to Farm Basics 4. Let's go through the warm-up. First question, what structures are derived from the branchial pouches? So the first branchial pouch is where we get the mastoid air cells, the middle ear cavity, and the eustachian tubes. The second branchial pouch is the lining of the tonsils. The third pouch is the thymus and also the inferior parathyroid glands. And then the fourth pouch is the superior parathyroid glands. Next, what structures run through the cavernous sinus? So you have the oculomotor nerve, which is cranial nerve 3, the trochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve 4, the abducens nerve, which is cranial nerve 6, and the ophthalmic nerve, which is the first division of the trigeminal nerve, the maxillary nerve, which is the second division of the trigeminal nerve, and also the internal carotid artery. And the last question, what are the clinical features of osteogenesis imperfecta? So osteogenesis, you're going to think about brittle bones, and that leads to multiple fractures. You can see those blue sclerae. You're going to have dental problems and also hearing loss. So that's it for now. Let's move on to the lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Late Night Talk Show Lowe's. And here's the star of our show, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to another Step 1 lecture. Why are you all laughing? I don't get it. I need my intro for this lecture. I was way too drunk. I mean, tired last night from studying. Oh, you guys read the script wrong. This lecture is about beta blockers. It's O-LOLs, not LOLs. I hate LOLs. Beta blockers end in O-L-O-L, O-LOL. Now this all makes sense. All right, well, I guess since I'm here, I'll do a little comedy. Don't you just hate people who say LOL? Okay, okay, touchy, touchy, move on. Okay, so guys, in the last lecture, we talked about sympathetic activation. Now let's do a super rapid review. So in that sympathetic nervous system, we have very short preganglionic fibers stimulating those nicotinic receptors on ganglions that are very close to the spine, and then very long postganglionic fibers that secrete norepinephrine that stimulate adrenergic receptors uh, at the effector organs. Now, remember those four important adrenergic receptors, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. Remember that alpha-1 is causing an increase in peripheral resistance, increased bladder sphincter tone as well. Alpha-2, remember, it inhibited norepinephrine release on the presynaptic neuron. Beta-1 increases heart rate and contractility. Beta-2 causes mild vasodilation, and more importantly, bronchodilation. Now, the drugs we talked about vary depending uh, on the effect on each one of those receptors uh, that are found on those different concentrations throughout the entire body. So now we're going to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. And just like the mimetic drugs, these drugs will act depending on their effect on the specific adrenergic receptor. And we even refer to them as such. So there are alpha blockers, there are beta blockers, and a couple others that really don't fit into those categories exactly. So the first thing we're gonna talk about are the alpha blockers. So remember that alpha-1 receptors maintain our vascular resistance and also some urinary sphincter bladder tone as well. So if you block them, then we should expect a decrease in blood pressure and a relaxation of the bladder sphincter tone. Now alpha-2 receptors tend to uh, uh, decrease norepinephrine release, uh, and the alpha blockers in general are divided into drugs that are non-selective, meaning they block both alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors, and then selective agents that only block alpha-1. Now the more commonly used medications are the selective blockers, and they include drugs like prazosin, doxazosin, uh, terazosin, and since they block alpha-1, they tend to decrease blood pressure. Now clinically, probably they're used more often for their effect on bladder sphincter relaxation. Specifically, they're used in men with benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. Now their side effects include postural hypotension. So when they stand up, they tend to drop their blood pressure. And that certainly makes sense because these drugs will reduce peripheral resistance. Also, you'll see some reflex tachycardia as well. Again, that makes sense because when your body senses lower peripheral resistance, it tends to react by increasing the heart rate. Rebound hypertension is also a concern when you stop these medications abruptly. Now, there's one other alpha-1 selective drug that I want you to, uh, to know about, and it's tamsulosin. So tamsulosin is an alpha-1 antagonist uh, used to treat BPH, and it's inhibiting the smooth muscle uh, contraction in that bladder. So it's just like your zosin drugs. But this one is even more selective. It's selective for what's called an alpha-1AD receptor, which is found really just in the prostate. So it relaxes that smooth muscle in, in the prostatic region and that uh, urethral uh, smooth muscle so that urine can pass more easily. It does not relax the vascular 
particular 1B receptors. That's what you're gonna find in your vasculature. So tamsulosin is not going to lower your blo blood pressure near as much as the typical alpha-1 blocker. So patients with BPH with high blood pressure, maybe you go with a zosin drug. If they don't have high blood pressure, go with tamsulosin. Now the non-selective alpha blockers are not used clinically all that often. Phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine are used in the diagnosis and temporary treatment of things like pheochromocytoma. Now since we don't see that very often, we don't have much use for these medications. Now one of the reasons we use phenoxybenzamine is because it irreversibly binds to the alpha-1 receptor uh, and even very, very high levels of catecholamines are unable to stimulate those alpha-1 receptors that you might see in pheochromocytoma. All right, so the next class of uh, sympathetic inhibitors are the beta blockers, and we use these all the time. Uh, and again, we have a few subgroups depending on which receptors that we're inhibiting. First, we have the non-selective beta blockers, which, as you can probably guess, block both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. And these drugs include propranolol, timolol, and natolol. Now, the beta-1 selective drugs include drugs like metoprolol, atenolol, and esmolol. And there actually uh, aren't any really clinically usable just beta-2 selective drugs. So when we talk about a selective drug for the beta blockers, it's just a beta-1. Now we have two kind of unusual beta blockers uh, called uh, acebutalol and pendolol. So they're actually very weak agonists uh, at the beta-1 and the beta-2. But because they are so weak, they actually act as blockers because they're blocking uh, the much more potent effect that epinephrine or norepinephrine uh, would have on those very same receptors. Uh, you would consider using these drugs in uh, patients who have hypertension and bradycardia because these don't actually uh, affect uh, the decrease in heart rate as much as some of the other beta blockers. And then finally, we have these hybrid drugs. These are the alpha beta blockers, and they include things like carvedilol and labetalol. They block at alpha 1 and beta 1, so you get the regular beta blocker effect, but you also get some peripheral vasodilation as well. Now, beta blockers are used quite often to treat a lot of different things. Uh, specifically, hypertension is probably the biggest one. Also, by blocking beta-1 receptors, you slow the heart. You can decrease uh, uh, the contractility and thus decrease the overall work of the heart, which is highly favorable with patients with things like coronary artery disease. So you'll see a lot of these drugs being used with patients with angina, patients who have had a heart attack. Beta blockers can also slow the progression of congestive heart failure, but you have to be careful in patients uh, in a CHF exacerbation. Those patients are not pumping very well, and they have things like pulmonary edema and lots of problems. So slowing the heart may actually make the situation worse. So sometimes you have to take people off their beta blockers if they're in exacerbation. Now, less commonly, beta blockers are used to treat uh, patients with symptomatic uh, hyperthyroidism or very, very rarely uh, the serious thyroid storm. Sometimes we use them for migraine, headache, prophylaxis, or even for anxiety. I have patients who use propranolol uh, when they have to give a speech in front of a, a large group of people. So we established that by blocking beta-1, we decrease the heart rate. And now this is achieved by slowing down the SA and the AV nodes. So you can use this in patients with supraventricular tachycardia as well. However, it also becomes a major side effect as well. When prescribing these medications, you can certainly cause things like bradycardia, which can lead to lightheadedness and even syncope. One not so obvious clinical usage of beta blockers is in glaucoma. Uh, beta blockers, when used topical, topically like, say, uh, timolol, can actually decrease the production of aqueous humor and improve the situation of glaucoma. Another use for beta blockers is aortic dissection. Uh, so beta blockers are the antihypertensive drug of choice in patients with aortic disse dissection. So in aortic dissection, the high blood pressure is causing a dissection or a tearing between the two layers of the aorta. So you need to lower the blood pressure first to prevent this from getting worse. But you don't just uh, reach for any drug. You typically reach for that beta blocker because beta blockers not only decrease the blood pressure, they decrease the slope of the rise of the blood pressure. So it's not just the high blood pressure that's making that aortic dissection worse. It's that rapid increase of BP during each beat of the heart. So that's why beta blockers are the antihypertensive drug of choice uh, for aortic dissection. Now what are the effects of blocking the beta-2 receptors? So uh, if you're using maybe a non-selective beta blocker, uh, you're blocking beta-2, which can lead to bronchoconstriction. So you definitely want to avoid these beta blockers in patients who have asthma and those who have COPD. The selective beta-1 blockers are better, but still you need to be a little bit careful when using uh, those drugs uh, even in uh, this population as well. Now let's talk about some more adverse uh, reaction with beta blockers, pretty high yield stuff. Beta blockers can uh, decrease uh, glycogenolysis uh, and glucagon release. So therefore, diabetic patients uh, on anti-diabetic medication may be at a little bit higher risk of hypoglycemia. I personally don't see this very often, but you might see that on your test. 
Probably more importantly though, is that beta blockers prevent many of the symptoms associated with hypoglycemia. So when a patient gets hypoglycemic, they get shaky, they get tachycardic, they get really sweaty. But beta blockers prevent this from happening, therefore patients can even get more hypoglycemic and not even know it. Now another point I want to make about uh, the beta blockers is when dealing with cocaine. So if you have a patient who comes in uh, with a cocaine overdose or who is really intoxicated on uh, cocaine, they're having a lot of tachycardia, a lot of hypertension, you might want to give them maybe like a beta blocker to bring that blood pressure down, right? Well, the answer is no. Uh, we don't want to give these patients uh, who are on cocaine a beta blocker. So why is that? Well, cocaine is going to cause stimulation of all the adrenergic receptors. Not directly, but indirectly. Remember it from our last lecture, it's going to reduce the uptake of all those uh, catecholamines. So, all of these are going to be acting on all the adrenergic receptors. Remember, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. And remember, uh, sometimes that beta-2 is going to actually cause some vasodilation. And that's going to help uh, kind of temper the hypertensive response of a cocaine uh, um, uh, intoxication. So if you give a patient cocaine, uh, that's going to stimulate alpha-1, and that's going to raise their blood pressure, but it's also going to be stimulating beta-2, and that's going to help reduce that blood pressure just a little bit. Well, say you give that same patient a beta blocker. It's blocking the beta-1, it's blocking the beta-2 response, and all you have left is what we call an unopposed alpha-1. So uh, you may have uh, an actual increase in your blood pressure when you give a beta blocker to patients who are already on cocaine. Instead, we use things like benzodiazepines to calm them down. You might even use something like fentolamine, uh, which is an al alpha blocker that we talked about before, and that's going to decrease that uh, sympathetic stimulation. Now, another potential problem is if you abruptly stop a beta blocker. You can actually get a rebound tachycardia, maybe a rebound hypertension, and even an arrhythmia in, in susceptible patients. You may have heard that beta blockers cause erectile dysfunction. You hear about that all the time. Now, recent studies actually haven't really found this uh, to be the case. Also, let's think about that. What controls erection? Remember the mnemonic point and shoot. So erection is initiated by the parasympathetic nervous system. So how can we uh, inhibit an erection by inhibiting a receptor in the sympathetic nervous system? Well, you probably can't. Now, some studies have guessed that uh, this may be a placebo effect because men have been told for years and years beta blockers can cause ED, and once you start thinking about it, well, then it kind of happens. Okay, guys, so you better know your OLALs by now. Let's see if you know which category goes with each beta blocker. All right, everybody, welcome to another Lewis Notes. Today we're talking about beta blockers, and you need to know where all these beta blockers are going in regards to category. So, because there's a big difference between a non selective beta blocker, a selective beta 1, a partial, an alpha beta, and then I threw in your glaucoma drug, so you can remember that all of these are oral, some of them are eye drops. So, the first one here is metoprolol. We use metoprolol all the time, and it's a very commonly used selective beta 1 blocker. Atenolol, also a selective uh, beta 1 blocker. Propranolol, um, not used as much, but still I use it here and there, and it's a non-selective uh, beta blocker. You've got to be careful because it might cause some bronchoconstriction. Timolol, I put twice here because not only is it a non-selective beta blocker, but we use this for glaucoma. And then acetabutalol is one of those funky ones. It's one of those partial agonists. Remember, it's very, very weak. So even though it's stimulating that receptor, it's blocking it enough um, that it's not near as powerful as, say, uh, norepinephrine binding to it. Carvedilol is one of those alpha blockers, you're getting alpha-1 and beta-1 uh, control there. Nadolol is also a non-selective beta blocker, and it's going down here to glaucoma drugs as well. Pendolol is another one of those weird partial agonists, um, and that's uh, one of those situations where you might want to control blood pressure, but you don't want to drop the uh, heart rate very much. And labetalol is another one of these cool alpha-beta blockers. So if you can kind of get all those uh, together um, and figure out where they are, uh, then you can do a lot of lols. So I uh, hope you learned something. That's it. So next I want to talk about two drugs that are not antagonists like our previous medication. They're actually agonists. And more specifically, they are alpha-2 agonists. Now remember the alpha-2 receptors are located on the presynaptic neuron and they act to inhibit norepinephrine release from that same neuron. Now the two medications are clonidine and alpha-methyldopa. Now we covered clonidine in the last lecture because that's when we had all of our agonists. Now overall these medications are acting centrally and are decreasing sympathetic tone. So remember they decrease the release of norepinephrine from the presynaptic neuron. Clonidine can be used in an outpatient setting uh, when a patient is having a malignant hypertension. So you can give them clonidine orally in the clinic and it will actually work relatively quickly. I generally don't like doing this very often unless things are really bad because one of the unfortunate side effects of these medications uh, is rebound hypertension. So uh, you may have uh, improved the BP in the office, but a few hours later, that BP may go even higher when they get at home. Clonidine is sometimes used as a sedative, and again, that makes uh, sense because it's decreasing the overall sympathetic tone in the body. Methyl dopa is not used very often for hypertension in general, but it's still sometimes used in pregnancy-induced hypertension. 
Okay guys, that's gonna be it for the lecture part. Now it's time for that end of session quiz. Let's go through these answers together. First question here, which selective alpha blocker has less effect on blood pressure? Remember, that's going to be Tamsulosin. Next, what are the common side effects of beta blockers and which patient population should uh, use caution uh, when taking beta blockers? So, some of the common side effects. First one, we have bronchospasm, especially with those non-selective beta blockers. You never want to use a non-selective beta blocker in a patient with asthma or COPD. And in general, uh, just use caution with even all the selective beta blockers as well. Beta blockers can lower blood glucose uh, and they can mask the sympathetic symptoms of hypoglycemia. Uh, so you need to use caution uh, when you're giving a beta blocker to a diabetic. And then they can also cause bradycardia and even an AV block. They can depress myocardial contractility. So you wanna use caution in giving beta blockers to patients with really bad or uh, uncontrolled CHF, uh, especially in an acute exacerbation. Next. What are the various clinical applications of beta blockers? So beta blockers can be used for a lot of different things that we've gone over, primarily hypertension, but you can also use it for CHF, supraventricular tachycardia, angina, MI, and some beta blockers are used for glaucoma as well. And finally here, we have a couple rapid uh, fire facts here. Pheochromocytoma uh, is an alpha antagonist. A BPH selective alpha blocker, like we said before, uh, go with Tamsulosin. All right, guys, so that's going to be it for Farm Basics 4. I hope you learned something. See you next time. When we left, Michael had just gotten himself up to the $300 mark. Not bad. I guess you respond well to pressure. Let's keep it going. Next question for $400. Which of the following drugs is both an alpha antagonist and a beta antagonist? A. Carbetalol. B. Propranolol. C. Terazosin. Or D. Phentolamine. Okay. Wow. I think I know this one. <laughs> one does never cease. Yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely, uh... Hesitation kills. You must know instinctively and act immediately. Lives may be at stake. Uh, it's Carvedilol. Final answer. Carvedilol is... Correct for $500. No more lucky guesses, smart guy. The next question is for $500. Which of the following drugs is a non-selective beta antagonist? A. Atenolol. B. Natalol. C. Metoprolol. Or D. Esmolol. Do you need me to read the question again? No. No, I can hear you just fine, thanks. No need to get snappy with me, mister. It's not my fault you have a brain the size of a pea. I think it might be natalol. You think? Yes, natalol. Final answer. Natalol? It's come back for $500! Wait a minute. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Tune in next time while we play Who Wants to Be a Gunner?